Hey guys, welcome. This is the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. You're in for a special treat today because one of my really, really good friends, Rob Swanson, is going to be on this podcast with us today. And uh, we're going to be talking about, guess what? You guessed it, this crazy market right now in 2020. What is going on? Where is the opportunity? How can we profit? How can we make money in this crazy economy that we have going on? And uh, I don't know many people smarter than Rob. And uh, that's why I wanted him on the show. He's been through several different cycles in the market. Uh, he's a super smart guy. I'm not kidding. One of the smartest investors I know. And we've become friends over the years. I've learned a ton from him. So we're going to be doing a podcast with Rob Swanson here talking about the market conditions in 2020. What can we do to th survive and thrive in this market? I got a few things I want to announce though, first of all. Number one, I am doing this podcast live right now on YouTube and the Facebooks. I think YouTube's working. It was telling me there were some errors and problems there. If you're watching us live right now, please type in the comments and say hello. Tell us where you're from. Say hello as we go through here. Um, you know, if you've got any questions for us, type them in there. Okay. The other thing is we're going to be recording or releasing this as an audio podcast. So hello, uh, podcast listeners right now. I love you guys. I appreciate you all very much. And uh, so if you are a listener of this podcast, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to the show. Just go to Apple Podcasts or Google Play or Stitcher or TuneIn Radio or iHeartRadio. I am, we're on all of them. And subscribe to the channel. Let us know that you're out there. And then every week as we release new episodes, in fact, over the next few weeks, I'm going to be releasing episodes a lot more regularly. I have been doing three uh, episodes a week but I'm going to be doing probably five a week. I'm going to be doing more interviews like this with Rob, but I'm also going to be doing short little 15 minute podcasts, teaching some really cool stuff that I think are going to be important for you to understand uh, and be aware of as we go into this market, as the market is changing. Okay. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast. I have a lot of things in my podcast that I don't even release in my courses. I don't talk about in my emails. Uh, you may see a podcast that doesn't become a YouTube video. It's not on Facebook. So the podcast is the place, the main place I go to release my my stuff, okay? And um, so go check it out. The second thing I want to tell you is my book. This book has become more important today than ever. It's called Wholesaling Lease Options. You can get it for free. Just pay shipping and handling at wlobook.com, wlobook.com. You can read it in a couple hours. It's all killer, no filler, and it's just really good jam-packed content. I was so discouraged because I spent months writing it. I got it back from the publisher, and it was only a quarter of an inch thick. But um, this book walks through how to do a lease option deal from beginning to end. And not a, a, a long-term sandwich lease option deal, but a quick flip wholesaling lease option deal. So you can learn how to flip lease options. It's one of the easiest and fastest ways to make money in real estate today that I have found. And this is what, when I, in 2008, when the market collapsed, I quit my job in 2009. A year later, everyone thought I was crazy, but I was doing this. I was flipping lease options. And I show you how to do this for free in the book. Just pay a little bit of shipping and handling. And I'll send it out to you. Go to WLO book dot com w l o book dot com a lot of people are talking about this this is really important we're going to be talking about lease options as well a little bit on this podcast all right so should we bring over rob what do you guys think should we bring over rob i think we should rob swanson how are you my man i'm good buddy what's going on man i'm so glad you're here uh i, I it's an honor to have you on my podcast i remember when i was getting started in real estate watching you uh, reading all of your sales letters, watching all your webinars. Um, we've done a, we've done a lot of business over the years, we right? Have. Remember we have, we created that lead, uh, leads in an hour course. Totally remembered. It was awesome. <laughs> I so, loved it. People, I'm still getting positive feedback from that. Um, in that yeah. course, we taught you how to get leads for free in under an hour. You, and we have had so many students that took that course and just gave it to their VAs. Mm -hmm. and said, go do this, right? And yeah. they get tons of leads. So that's a course Rob and I created together. Boy, when did we do that, Rob? It was, uh, we launched it in October of 2013. Wow, October 2013. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? We need to dust the, the cobwebs off of that, I think, maybe. For right? sure, man, for sure. 
Um, so Rob is now the owner. He's not the creator, uh, but he's the owner of Freedom Soft, and he's pretty, you, you pretty much have recreated it. Well, we yeah, man, we ripped it apart. Um, yeah. You know the you, you know the story, but I'll just share it real quick. The story is I didn't buy the business because it was a great product. I bought it because it was a great business, and I knew that we could take the great business and reinvest in and create the great product. So five years, uh, about 90% rebuilt. Here we are today. So oh, probably 95%, 98% yeah. maybe. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a different, it's a different product for sure. So, uh, a lot of you guys know me. I was the podio Joe guy, right? Like I was the guy who was a big fan of podio. I pretty much introduced podio to real estate investors yeah. way back in the day. Um, I remember I, one of my coaching clients introduced it to me. I was at a mastermind a week later with Sean Terry. I sat down with Sean Terry and I showed it to him and he freaked out. And all of a sudden, a bunch of gurus in the industry started talking about Podio and pretty soon everybody was using it. It was it was better than what we had maybe back then. But the problem with Podio, and this is why I don't use it much, any, well, I don't use it at all for my real estate deals anymore. We still use it for administrative things, right? Um, but like there are so many third-party plugins that you have to plug in to, to do it with, right? Um, so I started using freedom soft a couple years ago, fell in love with it. I said, Rob, I want to customize freedom soft for lease options. Can I white label it? And uh, we, we said, yeah, sure. And so, um, I've been using, I created a product called REI simple, which is powered by freedom soft. And it's just, I've customized it for lease options and added in my websites and my contracts and my, uh, uh, workflow automations and things like that. Guys, let me tell you something. There is nothing else out there in the market today that does as much as Freedom Soft or REI Simple does. It's absolutely amazing. It's a game changer. He completely rebuilt it. It's funny too. You tell a story because I used to use it way back in the day mm -hmm. and it was painfully slow. <laughs> and you did something where you just had a developer go in and like, what? In a change something and it instantly yeah yeah it was the the thing what ultimately ended up happening is the thing that was slow right before i bought it was a single line of code that was creating a code loop and it was just spinning the servers and that got fixed the week before i closed <laughs> <laughs> so it's been it's, it's, he's done some amazing improvements in it my students get it for free when they sign up for my course for three months and uh it's just it's a game changer People are using it, are loving it. It does all of, I don't, this isn't a pitch for um, Freedom Soft or REI Simple, but there you go. It's right there. Go check it out anyway, because yeah. it, it'll change your business. It makes everything so much easier. Go to reisimple.com um, or, or just go to freedomsoft.com if you want to deal, if you want directly with what Rob has. But REI Simple is what I've used and customized. Um, it's, it's a game changer. There's so many things that it does now under one platform that I used to have to have four or five different platforms that I was paying two to three times as much to get mm -hmm. it to do less than what FreedomSoft does. So thank you, Rob, for, for doing that. Seriously. Absolutely, man. Um, okay. So I want to give a shout out. Oh, good. YouTube is working. Listen to this. Victor. Victor from Maryland tuning in. Purchased FreedomSoft three weeks ago. Awesome, Victor. Cool. That's awesome. Well, um, we've got Nathan. Hey, Joe. I think Nathan's in Tennessee, Nashville, I want to say. How you doing, man? Um, yes, Nas Nathan from Nashville watching on the YouTube. Um, Dan has a question here about, so he's got two properties under contract and wondering if I should back out and, and let the earnest money go. Oh, this is a good question. We will answer this yeah. later with Rob Yeah. because um, we're going to be talking about the market. Michael Stansberry, what's up from Memphis? How you doing, man? Ty Jones, how you doing? David from Orlando, Florida. Glad you guys are here. Paul from Michigan. What's going on? Um, what software am I using to get the words on the screen? A lot of people ask me that. It's called StreamYard, and I'm using StreamYard in connection with Restream. Um, so good. Nathan, FreedomSoft is awesome. I love being able to change contracts on the fly. Oh, this is, this is one of the main reasons I jumped over to FreedomSoft because there's no other CRM out there that lets you create the contracts, like just a click or create a contract and get in there and edit it and modify it from inside the platform. So literally guys, you can take any contract, you can take a realtor's contracts that's obnoxiously long and has a tons of stupid stuff in it, but you could use a realtor's contract, put it into REI Simple or FreedomSoft and then 
just do a click of a button and it creates the contract, fills it out for you, click another button and you send it to the seller or you can send it to click to mail to print it and mail it in the physical mail to sellers. Um, this for absolutely was a game changer. And, and some people take this for granted uh, when, when they've been using freedom soft for so long, they're like, well, what's the big deal? But like mm -hmm. the big deal is there's no other CRM that does that. <laughs> so right. it's amazing. Right. Um, all right. So there's a bunch of people here. I'm, I'm thank you, Rob, for taking the time out of your busy day. You're in Denver, Colorado. I was just in your neck of the woods last week. Um, I got a fever blister right here because I was out in the, in the sun so much oh, no. up in the mountains uh, near winter park to this ranch, this huge 8,500 acre ranch. Yeah. Absolutely epic. It was so beautiful. I was disconnected, love the mountains yeah. and I'm jealous. <laughs> well, this is like the third time now that you've taken your family on a vacation through Denver and you haven't stopped at my house. I know, man. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna make that happen one of these days when you're coming through. I got I got plenty of room for you and your I know you got a big family, but I got plenty of room for your whole family here. And I know I'm a good cook. You are. I am. I'm a good cook. All right. Well, I'll take you up on that. <laughs> um, so Rob, lots going on. Yeah. A lot's been happening the last couple, three weeks. People are kind of getting scared. Yep. People are, are, um, there's, I think, I think I see kind of people having two different reactions. Maybe yeah. they're overly optimistic. They're like, just, this, this is going to blow over. Yep. Not a big deal. Yep. And other people are like, it's the end of the world. The sky is falling, yeah. you know? So what, where are you at? In yeah. That I'm in the, I'm in the middle of that. And, and the, you know, oftentimes there's, you know, there's the extremes, right. And, and those extremes are what you just talked about. And somewhere in the middle, there's truth. And the reason I'm in the middle and the reason I am, I'm not, you know, panicking and I'm not being ignorant, uh, or just too optimistic is because I've been through it. Right. Um, all of the stuff, Joe, that is being talked about in the media today or like the, the hype and the fear that is in the media today, the headlines and, the, and the, the sky is falling, it's not that different from a fear uh, sales pitch that we had in 2007 and 2008. I mean, it was the same conversations I was having back then with people that were the world is falling apart or it's just going to blow over. And again, there was truth in the middle. And so uh, one of the things that I often ask people is who remembers Monday, August 13th, 2007. And we can ask the, the audience that's listening to this right now. Monday, August 13th, 2007 is the day that I realized Wall Street stopped buying the debt. And a buddy of mine called me up. It was Monday morning. I was getting up and I was just going to, you know, run the, the day like normal. And he calls me and he says, hey, man, it's over. And I said, what's over? And he said, my business, it's gone. He, and he was he ran a big uh, mortgage shop and they were they had a big line that they were recycling uh, three to five hundred million dollars that they were recycling every few days. And Wall Street was buying all of the debt off the back end, giving them their money back. They were making new loans, reselling them and that whole thing. And he said, Wall Street, stop buying your debt. We got a day and a half left. And that was Monday, August 13th, 2007 in the ensuing months. Now, and we'll fast forward kind of where we take some of this conversation. But August of 2007 is also the same day or month uh, that the Fed announced that they didn't believe that banks had the liquidity mm -hmm. to survive. And so in the ensuing months, uh, 2008, you had the AIG and the Bear Stearns and the Lehman Brothers and the bailouts and all of that stuff that, that came post that August event. And it wasn't until a year later, December of 2008, that the Fed dropped interest rates to near zero. So Joe, what happened last week from the time we're recording this? They dropped it to zero. They dropped it to zero, right? And so that hasn't happened since December of 2008, but it took them over a year to get to dropping it to near zero in the last crash. This time it happened in the first week yeah. of everybody kind of having this fear panic. And so th there's, there's some similarities to what we can talk about navigating through the last crash. There's also some differences that, that we can talk about 
But either way, my, my objective and my goal here is to give some insights um, and kind of lay out a path forward for people, things to be thinking about. And Rob, you've been you've been talking about this for at least six to twelve months already. Uh, you, uh, you 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 have a book. Yeah. Have you released it yet? No, I'm about to release it ah, because I, I, I've I kept. Know. Yeah, I've kept holding it back because uh, there, there's been a variety of reasons of why I've held it back. But I started talking about this in 2015, so oh, five right. years ago, and I have recorded trainings of me talking about the things that lead to the crash and the things that we as real estate investors can be doing to number one, prepare in advance. Number two, uh, identify, you know, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can look at history and I can draw some parallels and connections and see patterns that line up. You know, those patterns allow you to sort of connect the dots. And that's what I've spent a lot of time over the last number of years trying to do. Yeah. And what was the name of the book? Uh, the book is called Cash In, What to Do Before, During, and After the Next Housing Market Crash. And, yeah. you know, on this on this uh, uh, show, Joe, we can talk a lot about what is covered in the book. And I, I take it, you know, kind of the next level of depth in the book itself. But we can lay out a lot of the, the game plan right here. Well, I'd love to do that. Um, but I want to just I, a lot of people are nervous right now. Right. Yeah. And I, I want to know from you where are the opportunities? Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing I want to ask you. And I want the second thing I want to ask you, maybe at the end of this podcast is, you know, if you, if everything was gone, you lost everything, you had zero dollars in your name and you had 30 days to make five, 10 grand, what would you do? Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, let's talk about the opportunity. Um, where do you see the opportunity in 2020, 2021, you know, going forward for the next, you know, one to two years? Yeah. Um, so, uh, there was, there was, I think three questions there. So the first one is, uh, your first question was what do I see the opportunity is? Yeah, right where's now, the right? opportunity? Where's, where's the, the opportunity? Um, I think the opportunity is in a couple of things. Recognize that there's fear in the marketplace. Um, but if you, if you go back to Warren Buffett's famous quote, right? When everybody's greedy, be fearful. And when everybody's fearful, be greedy. Yeah. Let me break that down for a minute. Over the last five to eight to 10 years, everybody's been greedy uh, and, and everybody's been, the market's good, the market's going up, the market's going up, the market's going up. And so the fundamentals of real estate investing have been set aside and markets have made a lot of people look like they're smart real estate investors. They're not. The market was just on their side. Let's be frank, people got lucky. Yeah. Now I'll take luck. I don't mind. Yeah. I don't yeah. mind participating in luck. That's okay. But there's a lot of people that got lucky because the market gave to them. And, and um, I think the opportunity is to, is to now recognize that you've got to go back to fundamentals. You've got to go back to understanding what makes a deal a deal and why is it a deal. I, there's a question that I uh, ask, and, and I had a COO in my business, uh, Brad, for a number of years. And he, um, he would always say this. He goes, he goes, don't talk to me about the deal unless you can answer one question. How do I make money with it, right? So you have to be able to answer, how do I make money on any real estate investment deal? I think the next opportunity is fear creates motivation. And so when everybody's fearful, it's funny because real estate investors, Joe, how many times do people come to you and say, Joe, I can't find any motivated sellers. Joe, where are the motivated sellers? Rob, there's no motivated sellers. The market is too good, nobody's motivated. All of a sudden, Fear enters the market, people become motivated, and then everybody panics and says, I'm out, right? right. And yeah. so fear creates the motivation that everybody's been looking for. And so if you understand the fundamentals of investing, if you understand that fear creates motivation, you know what you do? You make more offers. Yeah. You make more offers, you adjust your price, you make a lower offer or with better terms, and you keep making offers. Price cures everything, right? Price can cure everything. And so uh, I, that's kind of how I like to start thinking about it is, is make more offers. And then I think learning some uh, two things. So you're going to make offers and you've got to do two things. And I did this in 2007 and 2008. You've got to get really good at those creative offers, the creative deals. So you've got to learn creative real estate investing. Yeah. And you also have to learn how to get 
access to capital because cash is king. And whether you have cash today, whether you've been stockpiling it, whether you, you or whether you don't have cash today, it really doesn't matter. You can go get the capital for your business and and take advantage of of the fear that's in the market today. And and I, you know, people I, I got I got called out because I keep telling people like fear creates the motivation. There's there's patterns that we can see. So make more offers. And, and it's funny, you know, a few guys call me out on on Facebook or whatever and say, you know, that if that's just bad advice to say continue to buy today. Well, guess what? In 2007, August, when Wall Street stopped buying the debt, my buddy's business collapsed and the Fed announced that the banks didn't have liquidity. I said, I wonder what Warren Buffett's quote means. Let me go put a big fund together. So I got a capital partner out of Stanford, Connecticut, $175 million fund at the time. They're a, almost a billion dollar fund today. They carved off and they gave me $10 million. And the second quarter of 2008, amid Bear Stearns collapsing and Lehman and AIG and everybody else, I'm buying real estate. And everybody back then, except the old school hard money note guys in town were telling me I was crazy. Why are you going all in now? Yeah. Right. The markets are crashing. And I said, now's the time. Yeah. It's also, I totally, I couldn't agree more with the making more offers. We're starting to yep. see a ton of our old leads bubbling back up. Yes. Uh, Cause we're following up, which is so easy to do in freedom soft, yep. but like they're, they're bubbling back up. They're calling us from letters they've been holding on to for the last six to 12 months. Yep. And so a lot of, and so if you make an offer to every single lead that you get, it becomes so much easier to follow up with them. Now you don't have to keep that offer that you made with them six months ago, but when you do the follow-up, you can say, Hey, I'm calling you to follow up on that offer I sent you. That's so right. it gives you an excuse to call them, gives you an excuse to follow up. And uh, you made the post one time, this was before this, this scare like three, four weeks ago, um, somebody was complaining about not finding the sellers. Right. Mm -hmm. And you made a post about the answer is simple, make more offers. And you remember that you listed yeah. like 10 things and every one of them was make more offers right. and then follow up and make more offers. Exactly. And make creative terms offers. That's right. Yeah. Good. Um, all right. So Rob, um, talk about the, the opportunity. Now you're still, buying offers. In fact, you're doubling down, right? Are you doing more marketing? Are you um, doubling down on, on the lead generation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I told my guys, so, th so there's a couple of things, right? If you're smart about what you do and if you're smart about how you build your CRM and the, and the tools to organize your leads, Joe, you know this, I've, I've been saying this to you for years. I'm a big believer in organize before you automate because otherwise all people end up doing is automating chaos. And so I'm a huge believer in simple organization before automation, because what that allows you to do at this moment in time, if you're well organized in your lead management, you can go in to REI Simple and you can go into FreedomSoft and you can just select the segments of your list that are by status and do marketing to them. That's free. Right. And so what I've been telling my guys is, is do that guys make more offers. If you thought you were making enough offers a month ago, make more offers. Just the one constant in real estate is that things are constantly changing. Right. And so make a little bit lower offer, make a little bit better terms uh, offer, understand that the market fear adjusts what we have to do a little bit, but don't stop what we do because of that fear. Just adjust. Excellent. Talk about, are you guys doing any more buyer marketing or are you going out and, and calling your existing buyers and just getting the temperature of where they're at? Where, where are you, what are you guys doing there? Yeah. So in, uh, in 2007, um, I, you know, again, middle of all of this fear in 2007, I started what was called the Colorado Property Investors Association. It was November of 2007. It was our first meeting. I ran it for five years. Um, and the reason I did that is to is to bring some voice to the conversation to say, number one, you, we don't have to fully be fearful. Like, let's not be stupid. Let's understand that 
we have to have a plan B and maybe a plan C going forward. But yeah, we, we are doing direct buyer marketing, but we're doing it in kind of an authoritative way. We're bringing conversation and voice to this, to the story and what's happening in the market today so that people who are looking for a leader uh, can get someone to follow, right? Because I've been through it. I mean, I wasn't, there's a lot of guys and I'm seeing a lot of conversations out there on, you know, it's too easy to share your story these days, right? And so a lot of guys that either started after the crash and have, and have written it up or are sharing their opinions or guys that went into the last crash got completely crushed and then wrote out and, and have had success or sharing their opinions. I have a little bit of a unique perspective in that we navigated into the last crash. We navigated that turmoil successfully. We navigated through the crash and then we navigated out through the back end and up the ride. And so, yeah, we're, we're doubling down. If you want to call it double down, we're not stopping anything. We're just moving forward and saying, let's make the adjustments. Are you doing more wholesaling deals or are you looking for more buy and holds? Uh, what's your strategy? Are you doing any rehabs going forward? Over the next so, month? yeah. So I haven't been, I haven't been doing any flips, fix and flips for a number of years. Um, I, I think it's a great strategy. I fix and flipped hundreds, maybe thousands of houses. Um, and so I, I've, I've done it well. I've done it a lot. Um, I haven't been doing that lately. Um, I continue to buy and hold and I continue to wholesale. And so we're buying, one of the things that I think people need to understand in this market time is that there are, there are historical ebbs and flows of the market, right? Um, going back to the crash of 73, 74, you know, back when the dollar was, was taken off the gold standard and, and the fiat currency and debt was introduced into the market, into the 90, 91 crash with the savings and loans, and then into the 2007 and eight crash, uh, of, of last time, there are similarities through all of those. And so as we start to look at those, at those three similarities, one thing was, one thing was consistent at the end of each one of those crashes. And that is that rents on single family homes post crash went up. And so what I try to look at is I want people to understand there are two different types of markets. There are what you call the boom and bust markets. And those are the markets that scream up and crash and scream up and crash and scream up and crash. And there are what I call price stable markets. And so since 2015 or so, I've been buying predominantly in what I call price stable markets. And a price stable market is something that if you look historically over the last 30 years, give or take, the, the price hasn't gone up or down much, much more than, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20% through the ebbs and flows and contrast that with markets that are boom bust where you see 100% swings in, in price fluctuation, ups and downs. And so I've been buying in price stable markets, understanding that if I buy conservatively on cash flow today and the market crashes, I'm not losing a lot of significant value. It's it's fake money anyway. It's equity, right? It's not real. And I can't, can't I can't equity. spend it. I can't eat equity. And so if I lose that equity, I'm not really worried about it because I'm buying for the consistency of cash flow. Now, one of the things that I've done as well. And I, I talk about this, uh, I've started talking about this a little bit. I've been telling people to do this for a number of years, but people sometimes don't listen to me. And that is I've been buying in C to C minus even D plus neighborhoods. And a lot of my rental portfolio is on section eight. It's government subsidized housing. Now, hmm. Joe, you're going to laugh at this because, you know, Rob, the, the, the capitalist who's a capitalist, but I just, you know, not at the expense of people has most of his investment portfolio in a government subsidized program, right? Now, there was a reason I did that. In 2008, when everything crashed and blew up, I was fixing and flipping houses when everybody said you couldn't fix and flip houses. But the only money that was in the market or the majority of the money that was in the market was government subsidized FHA, first time home buyer loans. So I was selling everything to government backed financing. Well, when, as I started to see the market go up and up and up and up, and I know how that ends, right? It goes down. 
I said, the only people that are going to have money, if I have a rental portfolio, I don't want Johnny to lose his job and not be able to pay my rent. So I put most of my portfolio in Section 8 housing. The government pays the rent. And so there's things that you can think about as an investor and do even today yeah. that help you navigate forward. That's really good. Section eight though, um, people are going to be thinking class C, class D. Don't you have bad tenants? You know, aren't there problems that you have with getting good tenants? You know what I mean? How, how have you been able to manage that? Um, I haven't had a problem with it. Um, do, do you have, you have some bad tenants? Sure. You have some bad tenants. You know, a year ago, um, I had to wait an extra 17 days to get my rent check when the government shut down, right? Because they weren't processing the, the, the checks. Um, and so are, is everything rosy all the time? No, I'm not here to say everything is rosy. Look, if everything was rosy in real estate all the time, everybody would be a real estate investor successfully. Things happen. Things go wrong. Things are bad. Um, at the end of the day, um, it's how you respond and navigate through them that makes the difference. And so, um, I don't know. I Do I sometimes have a bad tenant? Sure. Um, do I sometimes have to evict a tenant that stops paying because they don't pay their, their section of the rent? Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, it doesn't, if you treat people well, like even, you know, there's a there's a triangle and at the top of the triangle if you're a landlord if you're in the in cash flow real estate income game the top of that triangle is your tenant like that's who you have to serve and so provide them with a good safe clean housing at a at an affordable fair price and i don't have much problem good um, so let's go through some of these questions we have here, Rob, Yep. because people are typing in questions. These are really good. This is from Dan. I have two properties under contract and I'm wondering if I should back out and let the earnest money deposit go. Probably depends on the deal. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, just what would you say to uh, somebody like Dan here, Rob? Well, I don't know anything about the deal. I mean, if the properties are worth a hundred and he has them under contract for 125 <laughs> back out. <laughs> um, if he's got, if they're worth a hundred and he's got them under contract for 50, don't back out. Right. So I don't know enough information to really give a good answer, but what I'll say is this price cures everything. Right. And so if, if Dan has navigated the fundamentals of this and, and purchased or, or made an offer and got under contract at a fundamentally good price, whether Dan decides to bring capital in and close on it himself and, or he decides to flip the contract and sell it to somebody else, it's, it doesn't matter. Do you see, Rob, the average wholesaling fees going down maybe over the next couple of years? Have we gotten, have we gotten fat and happy over the last few years where we're making 10, 15, $20,000 profits? Um, no. I don't, I don't see that that's going to happen. And I'll tell you why. Um, when we put our, when we put our fund together in 2008, our average wholesale fees that we were, that, that were in all of the deals that we bought through our fund were $14,068 on average. That means some of them were higher, some of them were lower, but on average, the front end profit money that came out of those deals was $14,068. That's those are good numbers all through 2008, 2009, 2010. Like those are good numbers. So what were you, what, you know, what's, has your average wholesale profit been higher the last few years though? Um, no, I think it's probably been a little bit lower than that hmm. um, okay. over the last few years. Um, so I would say that as the market got heated up, actually margins compressed. Hmm as the fear enters the market and as people get more fearful and the, and the margin and, and you know, you make lower offers, the, the margins increase and you're going to make more money. Yeah. Would you say there's a lot of money sitting on the side waiting to come back into the market and a lot yeah. of money sitting on the side excited about prices are coming back down now? Absolutely. Um, I, I think not only is there money sitting on the side, but I think there's money that's going to be pulled to the side 
Fed is going to look for a place to go. Um, and, you know, money doesn't disappear out of the markets for the most part, right? You've got the equities, stock market, you've got the bonds, debt market, you've got real estate are kind of the three biggie places where money moves around. And, you know, we can see what's happening in the stock market today. We can see what's happening in the bonds market today. You know, you've got the commodities markets, you've got some, some different markets, but real estate is where that money usually ends up going towards when everything gets beat up. So you, I heard you say this before. This is really good. Wealth doesn't disappear. It just transfers. That's right. Right. That's right. So um, where? let me ask you, the, related to that, the money that was already in the real estate market, where, yeah. is, that trans, where is that money transferring to? Uh, yeah, it depends. It depends. Um, you know, so if, if let's let's say that let's say that somebody has let's say there's a house that you know they bought it it was worth a hundred they paid seventy five and now it's worth you know it, it went up and it became worth a hundred and twenty five so worth a hundred value was a hundred they bought it for seventy five it's now worth one twenty five and now the market crashes and it goes down and now it's only worth seventy five. Well, maybe they paid off their debt. Maybe they only own uh, oh, 65 left, right? Or six, you know, 70 or something like that. But the market has crashed. Well, somebody's going to come in. If they can no longer afford to own that real estate, somebody's going to come in and buy that real estate from them. If they can't service the debt, they're going to either lose it and the bank is going to take it back and, or – they're going to sell it and somebody else is going to step in and, and take it from there. So that, that wealth that they had didn't disappear. It transferred to the new buyer. Right. right. And so in, and in order for that transfer to happen, in order for that wealth transfer to happen, there's typically a change of ownership. Okay. So change of ownership is when the transition and the transfer of wealth occurs. If you, if ownership remains, the, the perception of wealth may go down, but if the transfer doesn't happen, no, no wealth changed hands. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's kind of how I think about it. It's a good way to put it. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about, well, now we just got to go make lower offers. Right. Yep. And that makes sense. Yep. But a big part of that is still knowing what your buyers want, right. right. Knowing what the buyers are willing to pay. So yep. what are you finding as some of the good ways that people can start marketing for more buyers? What do you recommend? How do you find the buyers today? Yeah. Um, you know what? I, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I did back then. I'll tell you what I'm doing today. In 2007, I launched the Colorado Property Investors Association, became an authority starting to talk about this stuff. If I'm a wholesaler and I'm in the game finding deals and I can answer that one question, how do I make money with this deal? I want to, I want to, all of the potential buyers in the area to be coming to me. We're doing the same thing today. We, we've created uh, content and educational authority websites and, and different things to be the go-to source to say, what's going on? Where do I find my next deal? How do I need to think about this deal? Do I need to analyze it differently? Do I need to fund it differently? Is my exit strategy the same? We've become an authority to help talk about that. Now, what I like to do is then I like to go into a market and say, okay, where are, where are the deals, right? So there's a big problem. A lot of times a new wholesaler will go in and, you know, they've got the city and they go to the, they go to the west side of the city and they're, and they're looking for all their deals and they go get a deal that they think is a deal and then they put it out there and nobody wants it. Well, that's because all of the investors are buying on the east side of town, right? And so the first thing that I always do is, is I look in, and I ask the question, the guys that are already making money, where are they making money and how are they making money? Right. I don't have to be the, I don't have to recreate the wheel or figure it out. I just need to go find out what the successful investors are already doing and figure out how to participate in that, in that pool. And so we use the tools that you, you know, you teach your audience all the time to figure out where that happens. And, this again, let's put a plug in to um, Freedom Soft or REI Simple because you can get your cash buyers right there. That's right. All cash buyers by county yep. uh, or by zip code. And you, you download the list. You can see what zip codes they're buying in, yep. prices that they're paying. 
You can get the contact information of those buyers. You can send them a letter. You can skip trace them. By the way, have you ever, because you know how hard it is sometimes to skip trace LLCs. Go to Fiverr. I know you already know this. If you go to Fiverr and do a search for skip trace LLCs, you'll find dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of uh, VAs that will do skip tracing for you for LLCs. Yeah. And Joe, you don't even know this. You don't even know this yet, but we are a couple of weeks from releasing <laughs> uh, LLC skip tracing and corporate skip tracing right inside FreedomSoft. There you go. Oh, I love it. Yep. And this is again why I love FreedomSoft so much is you're constantly updating it. Yep. And pretty soon, guys, you're going to be able to skip trace LLCs inside of FreedomSoft and REI Simple. Yep. Love it. Okay, so we got some good questions here. A lot of people are saying hello. Um, Latricia from Kelly Destin, I think. Is that Florida? TJ from Georgia. Randy Simpson. Good morning, Joe and Rob. Hope everyone is well. Rob says hello. Matt Smith says hello. PJ, great content, guys. Thank you. I'm glad you appreciate it. Uh, I think we kind of answered this. Mark is saying, should you assign everything now or buy and hold anything? So let me just ask one more time. Mm -hmm. What makes it for you, Rob, a deal that you're going to hold or assign? Yeah. So in 2007 and eight, everybody told me that I was crazy to be buying like I was buying because the bottom didn't hit. I was, I was buying a lot of that in Denver. Yeah. Um, I had invested across the country when the whole thing crashed. I came back to Denver, which is a, a piece of the strategy that I talk about in my in my book. Um, and that is because I wanted to get back into the boom and bust market as the things had adjusted down and were, and were towards the bottom. Well, the bottom didn't hit until about 2012 in Denver. So 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, things are still going down, right? And so I talk about the rubber band effect. And here's Everybody said I was crazy to be buying. How do you know how low it's going to go? Well, here's how I figured out how to know how low it's going to go. I call it the rubber band effect. And if and if I can go in today and I can take a, a piece of real estate that's, say, worth 100 or rents for 1,000, and I can buy it in such a way that my either my equity or my cash flow, and just for simplicity, let's just talk about cash flow because when we're at the peak, I think we should be buying for cash flow. Let's say that it rents for a thousand and I can buy it and I can get my net cash flow after debt service, after Tim V, taxes, insurance, maintenance, management, and vacancy. I can get my net cash flow to be $300 a month per door. Okay. Then prices keep going down and then I can buy it and I can get 400 and then I can get 500 and then I can get 600 because the fear keeps going, the prices keep going down, but there's more demand in the rental market. There's a shrinking supply because they haven't been rehabbed enough. So rents are going up, prices are going down. And now I'm at what I was comfortable with at two, two dollars $300 a door. Now I'm buying for $500 a door net cash flow. And then all of a sudden 600 and then 700. And then somebody comes in and says, you know what? I don't need $700 a door. I'm okay with 500. So they outbid me and they pay a little bit more. And then they stay there and say, you know what? I'll buy for 500. And now that becomes the new norm. And then somebody comes in and says, you know what? I don't need $500 a door. I'm okay with 400. And they outbid and the prices come back up a little bit. And pretty soon we're back to this point where it's, 250 to $300 a door. And so as you look at a market and you, and you kind of calculate the rubber band effect, you ask yourself, how low is low enough? At what point does an investor come in and say, I don't need $700 a month cash flow on this you know, $1,000 rent. I'm okay with 600 or 500. That's the bottom. So you can figure out where the bottom is and you can adjust your pricing accordingly. And I, you know, I've just built, I'm a spreadsheet guy, I like spreadsheets. So I've built spreadsheets and models that kind of model that stuff out. And so I can go look at any market and I can kind of project where I think the bottom is based on that single question that I talked about, how do I make money with this? And because somebody's going to interject, I don't need that much money. I'm willing to pay a little bit more. You could figure out the bottom. Okay. So when would you, you're looking at a deal right now. When yep. are you going to decide 
to wholesale it, make 10 grand or hold it for cash flow? Yeah, I want to, I want to hold, I want to hold as much as I can. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a big believer in holding as much as I can un, unless as long as, so I've, I have really strong buying criteria for, for my personal portfolio. I like to buy three bedroom, one bath, Breaker stick houses, a thousand square feet uh, in C to D plus neighborhoods uh, that rent for eight hundred dollars or more because I like to buy Section Eight, but that rent for eight hundred dollars or more um, and have less than fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in repairs needed. If I can do those things, and then I'm looking for a minimum net three hundred dollars cash flow. And I want to put six thousand dollars in my pocket the day I buy. Through that's my, through that, refinancing, cash out through, refinancing. E either through either through a, a a long term debt cash out refinancing or through my the private money. I buy it cheap enough that I can borrow enough to cover my acquisitions costs, my rehab costs, and my operating cost to run that yeah. business. So that's my buying criteria. If I can fit that buying criteria, that box, I buy. Anything that doesn't fit my box, I wholesale because there are guys that have different criteria than me. So it's about knowing what you want to buy and being dead set that you're going to either get it or you wholesale it. This is good. This, I hope you guys are being encouraged by this, right? Because nothing is right now, Rob, telling you I'm getting out of the market. You're not no, going. No, no. <laughs> in fact, I'm going more in the market. Good. It doesn't. It doesn't mean what I did three months ago is going to be exactly the same that I do tomorrow. But but now is not the time to get out of real estate. Now is the time to get into real estate. Holy yeah. smokes! I don't know how many times I have to say that to people. But you know, the, again, that Warren Buffett quote: "Be." Fearful when everybody's greedy and greedy when everybody is fearful. Everybody is fearful, so you need to be greedy now. And the problem is most people just follow the fear and bounce. Yeah, very good. This is a good question from Mr. Thinker. All right. <laughs> uh, this is a different type of fear, guys. Many homeowners are not going to feel comfortable with terms now that they can evict you for an unknown amount of now that they can't evict you for an unknown amount of time. What are you saying to sellers to release it? So let's talk about why would a seller accept a terms offer right now in this market? Well, okay. So I'm not, let me, let me read Mr. Thinker's question here. This is a different type of fear, guys. Many homeowners are not going to feel comfortable with terms now that they know they can't evict you for an unknown. Oh, so what they're saying is that if, or what Mr. Thinker is saying is that if you become the tenant, in a, in a lease option purchase, yeah. yep, that the, the homeowner can't evict you if you stop paying. Well, if that that's, I think, the, what he's saying. I think so, yeah. So that homeowner has two choices, right? That homeowner can leave it vacant and just pay for the house, or that homeowner can put somebody else in there that they can't evict for an unknown period of time. So the question is, how much confidence can you give the seller to know that you're the right guy or the right gal that can step into that role because the seller has to make a decision at some point, either keep paying for it themselves and leave a vacant house that they're just going to cover the costs on or put somebody else that they can't do the exact same thing that they can't do with you into the property. So I don't yeah. see how it matters. So you still make the offer and you follow up because sometimes sellers just need time to cook. And don't overthink it, Mr. Anchor. Right. <laughs> That's right. Don't don't overthink this because there if the seller says no, there'll be other sellers that say yes. And and I've been doing this a lot lately. I've just been telling the sellers, you should list it with the realtor. I pull away, I take my offer away. And it's yeah. amazing when you do that. Instead of me chasing them, they start chasing me now. And it's psychologically does just it's amazing. It's like a miracle drug where you, you pull your offer away, you say you should go ahead and list it with the realtor then. Right. Have you thought about that? Um, so anyway, good question here from Mario real quick. Are you still going to be investing in small towns? We've been wholesaling a lot of deals lately, Rob, in small towns. Yep. What are, what are you thinking of small towns? I love it. 
I think small towns are great. Um, I, I've seen your your course and your stuff that you put out there and, and the content around small towns. I think it's super smart because it takes the competition away. Yeah. Um, it puts you in a it puts you in a king of the hill uh, position a lot of times. And a, a buddy of mine, in fact, just here in Colorado, he invests in small towns and he just ended up picking up a duplex from a lady who was owner financing it to him. And he's the only investor that has reached out to her. She owns 12 others yeah. or 12 total. So he's going to end up with 12 owner finance duplexes because she's 76 and just kind of wants to be done with it. Yeah. There is so much money. There's a lot of mattress money in small towns, but there's also yep. a lot of motivated sellers. Yep. Very little competition. And there's still a demand yep. for houses in small towns. Inventory is still low. All right. By the way, inventory is still low, right? That's right. There's not been a ton of new properties coming on the market recently. All right. Uh, quick question from Matt. Do you think markets like Vegas will stop significantly? What do you think is going to be happening to those hot markets that are going up and down right now? Yeah. The, um, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but let, let's look at history. Again, there's two types of markets. You've got your boom and bust markets. Historically, markets that scream up and crash, scream up and crash. Vegas is one of those, right? And you have your price stable markets, those markets that over the long haul um, have been relatively price stable. They don't go up and, and down. So just look at history, right? And you can go to the, uh, to, to the FHA's website and you can look at their historical price appreciation graphs and you can see whether a, a city is a boom bust market or a price stable market. Yeah. That's very good. Um, good question. Do you mind asking you a few more questions here? No, Bob? no, this is great. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, looking at the questions myself. There's well, you can see ones. them as well. Good. Yeah, yeah. This is from Victor. Is it better to buy via lease option because there are no closing costs? Are buyers more likely to accept lease options rather than subject to? So when you make your terms offers, Rob, how do you do your terms offers? Uh, it just depends on the situation uh, of the it depends on the situation of the seller. It depends on the situation of the financing and it depends on the situation of the, of the market itself. So um, I don't know that one is better than the other. I think that you just have to look at the scenario and make the best decision you can. I think it's really important just to say what we've been saying here to not be a one trick pony. That's right. Because a lot of the one trick ponies who only have a cash offer are going to, are going to have a harder time going forward. Uh, with this. You need to understand, learn creative strategies. I love lease options. Yep. There, there may be a place for subject to's owner financing. Yeah. Um, David, how do you select the properties you decide to put section eight tenants in, or do you target section eight for all your buy and hold properties? Um, I buy in, uh, I buy in neighborhoods. So I go into a city and I grid out a city um, a, B, C, D war zone, right? And I don't buy in war zones and I generally don't buy in A and B neighborhoods. I buy in C and D neighborhoods. And let me define those just real quick for people. Uh, so uh, a C neighborhood is generally 50% owner occupied, 50% tenant occupied. A D neighborhood is generally 80% tenant occupied and 20% owner occupied. The war zones then are 95, five, 95, tenant, 5% 5 owner, or even probably less. Yeah. But I look at those 50, 50 and 80, 20, uh, owner occupied to tenant occupied neighborhoods, good working class, blue collar uh, neighborhoods. And then I, and then I go in and I, I pick markets based on price to rent ratios. And that's how I do it. Excellent. Tyrone's from Nashville. What's up? Grant from Kansas city. He's just in there driving through there the other day. Um, what's up, Joe? What's up, Rob Swanson, my analytical brother. <laughs> That's right. I think one of the things I like about you, Rob, is that um, some people get really stuck in analysis paralysis, but you use analysis, deep thinking, intelligent analysis to make decisions quickly. Right. right? Big, big uh, difference. Mark, thank you. You're welcome. Yuri, 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 thank you for the feedback, gentlemen. Thank you. All right. Uh, good question here from Randy. Do we want to create an LLC for each buy and hold and or our JV deals to cover possible lawsuits for unforeseen legal issues? Um, what's your, just real quick, your philosophy on LLCs, one or many or 
Right. Um, yeah, I don't think you need one per property, but that's a personal that's a personal risk decision that you have to that you have to make. Um, I I tend to break my portfolio up into not one to one, but I but I definitely break it up um, into small groups. Um, there's a threshold that I generally um, am comfortable with, and then I buy with LLCs and trusts and. I do do a trust for every property. Good. Okay. Um, lots of questions here, but I do want to wrap this up because we've been taking up too much of Rob's time. Um, Bill is asking here quick, one more quick question. How do we keep track of the homeowner to make sure they are paying the mortgage on a terms deal? How do you make sure, Rob, they're paying the mortgage? Uh, yeah, with a uh, an authorization to release form. Um, and, or you can go as, depending on the structure of the deal, you can go as far as a limited power of attorney. Um, and so, and then track it, right. Or you make the mortgage Check. payment for them. Or, or, or yeah. yeah, best yet, you make the mortgage payment for them, but all always have that paperwork that allows you to verify with the lender for sure. Somebody else was asking, how do you stop them from refinancing? Well, you cloud the title, right? You file a memorandum of option or an That's affidavit right. of interest or something that clouds the title that will right. prevent them from refinancing it later. Yep. Um, oh, the good question here, because I wanted to ask you about this from Duanel. Uh, do you still use Pinpoint Pro Locator Pro? How did you call it? Pinpoint, Pinpointer Pro. Pinpointer yep. Pro. Do you still use that? And um, do you... Uh, you're going to be merging it with FreedomSoft. The question. Yeah, and, and f yes, the answer is yes. In fact, um, and we were just having a conversation before I jumped on uh, here, Joe, with you, um, with my team, and we are looking at integrating it directly into FreedomSoft. Um, we, you know, the I, I launched that product in 2014. Um, we are going through a development uh, update on it right now. I've got my development team working on it, and uh, we are about to bring it back to bring it back to the market and tie it in with FreedomSoft. Nice. So we're pretty excited about it. So thanks for asking that question. Yeah, I'm excited about that too. Especially, I think as the market starts shifting here, uh, and this is my prediction. It's more important than ever to know where the buyers are buying and what they are buying, and focus not just spray and pray marketing, but right. hyper focus, laser focused marketing uh, to what the buyers are buying. Because it's it's going to be shifting and changing. All right, one final, uh, two final questions, um, Rob. Um, if you were brand new, you lost everything, you lost your shorts, and you you know you're out on the street, almost homeless, and you got to make ten grand in the next thirty days. What would you start doing? Uh, I'd make offers. So I'd build a list, um, and I would build a list using Freedom Soft or whatever tool you have to build a list. REI Simple. Um, I would target uh, single family houses in what I would call a C to D neighborhood where investors are already buying. Yep. Um, and I would probably target vacant properties with out of state owners first. I would skip trace those owners. I would pick up the phone and I would start calling them. Can you and do that inside of FreedomSoft? You can do all of that inside of FreedomSoft, oh, REI Simple, can. absolutely. You can, are you serious? You can, do, you can do it in under five minutes, Joe. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. should do a webinar uh, yeah. just demoing that. Yeah. Would you be open to that? I, I totally would. In fact, this afternoon, I'm going to do a Facebook Live, and one of the things that I'm going to do, Joe, is I'm going to use our FreedomSoft or REI Simple's duplicate lead finder, yep. and I'm going to show people – if you're if you're using FreedomSoft REI Simple today and you have a, a big leads list, right? Lead management, or if you're off on another system or no system at all, if you upload your lists into FreedomSoft and use FreedomSoft's duplicate lead finder, I'm going to do a little training to to show people in these days of of turmoil. And I want to I want to pull my marketing back. What could you do for free using the tools that are right at your fingertips right now to go find some of the most motivated sellers that are just sitting there waiting for you to solve their problem? Oh man, that's so important because th there are so many of you guys right now that have, you're sitting on a gold mine of old leads. Yep. And all you need to do, if you have FreedomSoft or REI Simple, bring them in 
and you can like you're sitting on a gold mine and you could yep. start contacting them super easily through different channels, different ways, all inside of a platform. Yep. It's it's really cool. All right. So you, you talked about your book a little bit, Rob. Is that available now? Can you can people get that or how can they get a hold of you to get it when it becomes available? Yeah, so they can go to robswanson.com forward slash 2020. Robswanson.com forward slash 2020. And uh, that should, I think that'll redirect people right to the, the book. If it doesn't, you can just go to robswanson.com and, and you can see the book link right there and get on our release link. Good. Robswanson.com slash 2020. Go there right now. You're going to be doing a Facebook Live real soon here. People can look you up. Do they do they look up Rob Swanson or do they look up Freedom Soft on Facebook to find that live that you're going to do? Uh, go to yeah. Go find me Rob Swanson on Freedom or on uh, on Facebook, and that's where I'll be doing it. Okay. Uh, what what I what I do a lot, Joe, as you know, is I do trainings inside of our private uh, yeah. uh, Freedom Soft community. Uh, but this this is something that I'll do to the public. All right. So just go to, go to Facebook, do a search for Rob Swanson yep. and uh, you'll find that Facebook live. Even if you're listening to the recording of this, you'll be able to go back and look at his videos That's right. and find this live Facebook live there. Yep. Um, Rob, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Um, I feel encouraged, man. I, you know, this is one of the cool things I love about this technology that we have today to interview and see and get educated on podcasts and videos and stuff like that is, um, it's not all doom and gloom, man. This is right. where you guys need to be plugged in. Turn the news off. Stop right. going to Drudge Report. You know, <laughs> Stop going to Fox News and NPR and ABC and MSNBC and all of them. They're just going to bring you down. They're going to they're gonna discourage you. You're going to get scared. They have a – that's how they sell. Uh, um, they're in the business of scaring people, right? That's, that's right. what they want to do. You need to be above that. You need to stay positive. You need to be encouraged. There is a ton of opportunity out there and you need to pay attention and look for it and stay with guys like Rob on their Facebook pages and these YouTube videos and Facebook posts and, and podcasts and stay encouraged. Yep. Simple. And this book's coming out. What's the name of the book again, Rob? It's called Cash In, What to Do Before, During, and After the Next Housing Market Crash. Good. All right, guys. Thank you very much, Rob. Appreciate it. We'll see you all later. Go to robswanson.com slash 2020 to get Rob's book or go check him out on Facebook. We'll see you guys. Take care. Thanks, Joe.